Where I'm from and where I live, the holiday season is the snowy season. And so one tends to relate to the other. It's difficult, for me at least, to divorce a snow-covered landscape from my experience of the year's end and vice versa. Not the experience of holidays, necessarily, but more so what they entail. Time with friends or family members. Time away, if even momentarily and superficially, from work and responsibility. The visual surreality of a thousand objects under a cover of snow, all turned to the same color. All kinds of things and experiences difficult to put into words, like the kind of dim comfort of a warm interior made all the more so by company and the knowledge of what's going on outside. That, at least, is a thing the Danes have a word for. Hygge. Hygge is like English's cozy, but with more specificity and better branding. It may be tempting to say that English speakers don't have Hygge, or that we don't know it when we see it, because we can't name it, but we can. Rather, perhaps because of the importance or sheer incidence of a communal, low-key conviviality or domestic comfort sheltered from some exterior, it simply became expedient for Danes to name it. Similarly, there is the old roasting chestnut about how Eskimos, and here Eskimo is used purposefully to reference the Inuit, Inupiaq, and Yupik people, among others, about how they have 10, 15, 35 words for snow, and are therefore capable of discerning snow with an acuity beyond, say, your run-of-the-mill, desert-dwelling English or Spanish-speaking Burkina, that their language guides their perception which is not the case. Not so straightforwardly, at least. It's rather that, one, in an environment with endless snowy variations and snow-related situations, it becomes convenient and wise to name them. And two, their words aren't like ours. Eskimo Aleutian languages are polysynthetic. One word can function as a whole sentence does in a more analytic language, like English. Eskimo Aleutian languages have a good number of snow root words for falling snow, fallen snow, snow on the ground, and more, but through the addition and recombination of abundant morphemes, meaning all manner of things, speakers may produce single word forms for seemingly hyper-specific scenarios. Things like first snow of the year, diamond dust in the air, Snow softened by warm weather. Softly fallen snow. Snow good for making a giant snowball. English has slush, flurries, powder, drift, sleet, bank, flow, berg, crust, slope, thaw, rhyme, and more, each with and without direct translations or compliments in other languages, each naming what is capable and useful to name. But unlike English, Eskimo Aleutian languages don't have some set number of words for a subset of possible snow varietals. Eskimo Aleutian languages have an unset number of word-like constructions for an unset number of snowy and snow-related circumstances. And snow isn't special in that regard. The same is just as true for chair, fish, friend, ice, and any other base word in their lexicon. So why snow? And why Eskimo peoples? For sure because the two are strongly associated. Also maybe because we want to believe that speakers of Inuktitut, for instance, have a different, even magical sense for snow, rather than, say, generations of practical, direct experience with it. And perhaps even that, in some way, snow itself is seen as magical. So those who live with it must also be. What objects or ideas do or do not have words reflects nothing of what a person or people is capable, though. What objects or ideas do or do not have words reflects what a language's speakers tend to talk about. Their past, not their future. Why are things named? Not to enable perception, 
but to dance with it. To give a currently perceived object or situation which can be described an identity. How are things named? Well, there's no shortage of art in that process. Recombination of morphemes, neologism, resurrection. Hygge comes from the Old Norse and Proto-Germanic words meaning to think, reconsider. So maybe today it channels the monastic simplicity of hunkering down and being thoughtful, though not always in isolation. Met with snow-draped everything, it's true that I have no word for tree limb bent by the weight of snow, nor one for the snow itself, which is more wet than usual, but not exactly slush, nor for the dune-like drifts scooped into by the wind at the side of the road, nor for what David Berman calls the new acoustics of snow-filled air, or for the warmth of escaping those things with friends. I can perceive and describe them, but I have no single word for any. It's in those moments where the environment is an even, sometimes dumbfounding white, best viewed from inside, that the year-end feel hits me most strongly. Maybe an endless parade of movies and TV shows and, you know, 30 plus years of direct experience have solidified the connection. But there's also something else, harder to put into words, or word, as the case may be. It's a weird stillness brought on by snow-covered everything. A stillness where everything is hidden, some things even forgotten, which feels particularly appropriate for the end of a calendar year. We don't have a word for that kind of snow. But if I got to choose, at least, we would. <laughs>